Crimi Talk. I'm here with Laura today and we will be discussing the concept of sexual offending due to the issues that have surfaced from Hollywood mm. um, in the past couple of weeks uh, regarding Harvey Weinstein. Um, so we thought it would be appropriate to discuss the issues surrounding it um, and just throw in a bit of theory with it for you guys to um, understand things further. Um, and the first question for the day is, what is sexual offending? Um, what would you perceive? Well, I would describe sexual offending as being um, offending with, uh, of a sexual nature. So by that, I don't just mean necessarily um, rape, necessarily um, even physical touching. It could be harassment. It could mm -hmm. be grooming. You know, when uh, quite often when young men offend against um, children, they will, you know, in the you know the the gangs that we've seen in places like Telford and Rotherham, yeah. a large amount of that offending behaviour is actually grooming, mm -hmm. and that's why that's one of the things that the government are trying to clamp down on more, um, because that's kind of the the beginning of um, the chance to commit yeah, it's more like serious. The and, um, yeah, if you can cut down on that, then essentially. Um, you know, maybe the the rates of, especially regarding children mm. um, and trafficking and things like that, um, rates w could be lower. Um, I did get a definition here. Um, okay. Sexual offences will refer to sexual behaviours made illegal through law and regularly prosecuted against, such as paedophilia, um, viewing child pornography and rape. Um, mm. So that pretty much mirrors to what you've just said. Um, yeah, it's interesting that one of those things is something that people kind of try and use techniques of neutralisation to get away from their uh, role in, in actually committing an offence. The idea of consu that consuming child sex abuse images, looking at those images, oh, it's not actually an offence. It is an offence. It's yeah. understood to be an offence. And also, um, it, it, it is part of sexual offending behaviour. It yeah. is, yeah. Um, funnily enough, with regards to... Um indecent images of children and indecent images in general. We, I was involved in a discussion the other day um, and somebody was flabbergasted that the, her having pictures of her children uh, in, you know, as you do in the bath or in mm. underwear or vests and pants and things, she just couldn't get her head around the concept that that was an indecent image. Um, and we were trying to es explain to her, even though she's not distributing them as a child mm. as, as an offender a sexual offender would she she does hold you know indecent images yeah so um some people may be not committing sexual offenses because they're not distributing or using them maliciously but mm. you know you, you, you just don't you have something there that has the potential in the wrong hands because i think that's a really interesting point because um when back in the day before you took pictures on your phone um there were a number of cases where uh, people who worked for um, film development companies would be reporting people because they'd get they'd get a load of images that they were supposed to be developing, and they'd be of children in the bath or children getting dressed and that kind of thing. Yep. And they were from loving parents, and there wasn't actually anything wrong. But because obviously, when you see that in isolation without the context, it really shocks it's people. True. Yeah, it's true. And and if she, if so the wrong person was to get their hands on that image of her children, it could then be. it becomes an abusive image. You know, it's it's frightening in a way. Uh, the next question would have been, uh, who are victims of sexual offend offences? Um, obviously, we've, we've you know, just established children, um, but with regards to the Harvey um, Weinstein case, um, we've, over the, the past week, over messaging, mm. we've discussed, obviously, mainly women, um, and we've not necessarily discussed our own experiences because mm. I believe from from that hashtag have you seen it Me, yeah the, the hashtag me too and um, it appears that many women have experienced sexual harassment or mm. um, been sexually offended against even in its most minor forms so we can say that women are um, um, are victims as well uh, men Mm. Yeah. Did you see the, the brief interview with Tom Jones where he established that he'd been the victim once but he kind of brushed it off and thought that's what happens and mm -hmm. he was saying that it's a lot is going to come out he was mm -hmm. implying um, about the music industry mm -hmm. because he was saying basically this is not a Hollywood problem this happens uh, in the music industry as well um, and he talked about as well and I think it's an interesting point the responsibility he felt to get away from the person who was um, committing effectively, mm -hmm. who was you know offending against him, he felt that personal responsibility, yeah. and I think that's why a lot of these um, victims of or survivors have not reported so far 
because they feel that people will say, but hang on, you went to parties where he was at later on. It's victim you know, blaming, yeah. essentially, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, we've got this kind of weird idea of the ideal victim, which is someone that sort of runs from the room screaming, immediately phones the police, immediately tells their partner, mm-hmm. and people don't react like that. Yeah, it's, exactly. Yeah. It's precisely. Um, I think it's circumstantial as well, depending on the type of person you are, um, the, the severity of the offence, because all sexual offending are, is, is um, a horrible thing altogether. Uh, but obviously some cases are much worse than others, but at the same time it's perception, because some people wouldn't perceive certain things as bad um, as others, no matter how um, severe it is. And it matters who the victim is as well. We've seen that before with when those images of um, female celebrities were stolen mm-hmm. from their cloud oh, accounts yeah. and yeah. then leaked. People didn't see it as uh, they didn't see it as a normal revenge point. If it was if it was you or me, people would be like, "Oh, poor girl, I can't believe that happened." But because it's uh, it was a celebrity, people kind of denied their capacity to yeah. be a victim because yeah. they were oh, well, they've already got so much anyway, and they're yeah. famous because they're sexy. Well, actually, that doesn't matter. It's still her private image. Exactly, precisely, um, and that's what it's just. I think it's a social. The social issue as well. Um, and the next question, um, how are victims made to feel protected? Ooh, well, I suppose that's, it kind of depends on the circumstance. I mean, I think I've said on, on the show before, and I think it, it, there's a growing understanding that actually, certainly with children, quite often, although the, fen- the offence itself is traumatic, how it's dealt with by um, people in authority ab- mm-hmm. above the child, so parents, school, etc., that matters a lot. So when we get parents saying things like, my daughter's childhood's been stolen, she'll never be the same again, mm-hmm. she's been denied her chance to lose her own virginity, all those kind of things, that's actually really damaging and can, in some cases, be actually be even more damaging when you're talking about people being spoilt goods and that kind of thing than the offence itself. So I think in terms of, of people being protected, I think after the fact, it's an important point to not just to say it's not your fault. I think, I think most people now, when they acknowledge a, a proper offence has taken place, will say it's not your fault. Mm-hmm. But it's also to say there is a life beyond this. Just because somebody tr- um, tried to take advantage of you or, or managed to offend against you, there is a life beyond it. In terms of protecting people from being victimised in the first place, yeah. when you're looking at, especially when you're looking at the uh, Harvey Weinstein, it's a it's a question of what not allowing what Trump called the locker room talk. Mm-hmm. It's a question of not thinking it's funny to grab and harass people, and the same goes for women as well. You know, women sometimes they do it jokingly, but can humiliate men, especially you know young attractive well, in men. in saying that, um, I read an article yesterday. I shouldn't always live my life on articles, but um, I haven't actually read um, any theoretical things to back it up as yet. Um, But France have apparently um, put out a bill, um, passed a bill, um, for men to stop whistle um, and catcalling women Mm. in the street um, and groping them and things like that. Um, And I think that's a good way, that's a good start, um, obviously for women to feel protected, um, Mm. obviously against this growing issue of sexual offending. Um, But as well, you know, being transparent. I think it would be nice um, if they could have things out for men as well, because men mm. do get gr- men men do get sexually abused, women get sexually mm. abused, children get sexually abused. So I think maybe if that could be extended um, as a way of making everybody feel protected. In all of these cases, where not I'm not talking about where where a rape's taken place or or a serious sexual assault, I'm just talking about people, maybe people being grabbed, but certainly verbal harassment. Mm-hmm. What I, I think needs to change is at the moment we've got this emphasis on the right of the harasser to try and um, do whatever it is they're doing to make themselves feel, feel better. So, you, for example, you've got men who harass women in the street saying, you know, how else am I supposed to approach her? If I see a beautiful woman, how else am I supposed to actually know her right to not be approached or if she is approached to be able to politely say no, no and not be in fear is more important than your right to chance your arm and maybe get a date. Yeah. And with groups of women who sort of like are trying to, you know, show that they're fun loving or, or, or whatever reason they're doing it, you know, cat calling at, at men or, or, or grabbing young men inappropriately, his right to not be treated like that is much more important than their right mm-hmm. to show that they're having of a course, laugh and, yeah, you know, exactly. having fun on the hen exactly, night or whatever it is. I don't believe everything is banter. Um, that's my opinion. Exactly. Yeah. Not yeah, the term is. banter is so abused. Banter is something that you have with someone that you have 
some kind of closeness with, even if it's just um, and I think as it's colleagues. reciprocated as well. Absolutely, it's got to be. It's got to be a two-way thing. You don't have banter with somebody that sits there looking very uncomfortable while you and your friends laugh at him or her. Yeah. That's not banter. That's, that's, that's bullying. Yeah, bullying and harassment. Um, and uh, how are offenders managed or dealt with effect, um, and da or dealt with socially? Do you think it's effective enough? Well, I, th not, mm. I think it depends on the severity. I think that there is a, there is an understanding that um, there's a kind of socially an, an understanding that um, sort of high level, more serious offences, certainly any offences against children, have to be dealt with through the criminal justice system. Mm -hmm. Um, I think we've discussed Grandin loads of times. I think <laughs> yeah. I think Grandin is, is a great place for people who've committed sexual offences. If they're going to come to the realisation whilst in custody that this behaviour is damaging, then that's, that's the type the kind of environment of, that absolutely. I think, yeah, they're, they're and I think in, in wider community circles of support have been very uh, very useful in integrating people back into society because the uncomfortable truth is we do not class um, being a being someone who's sexually offended against children as um, something that makes you criminally insane in this country mm -hmm. um, and I think that's probably correct in certainly a, a lot of cases therefore people are going to be released into the community and I know that people find it um, repulsive and of course the offences themselves are terrible but if you're going to have somebody released back into the community, they need to have a stake in society and they need to be able to be integrated back in so they can make a positive contribution. As opposed to, yeah. Rather than people calling them monsters for the rest of their lives and not, and not being willing well, to allow them to I think that brings anything. us possibly to the next question, which I'll refer to in a moment. Um, the, the way that the media play um, have an impact on the concept of sexual offending. Mm. I don't think that they mm. help. No, not um, at all. Obviously, with certain certain things, as you said, obviously, when it comes to reintegrating sexual offenders back into society, the the uncomfortable truth is nobody, not not many people wish for that to happen. But mm. they, some in some cases, they do have to come out of prison at some time, um, and there's tools in place which um, Sarah referred to multi agencies. Um, Sarah couldn't be with us today, um, but she did leave some notes here. Um, and she works in probation, but she's made notes that there's um, services, uh, multi-agent services that do things um, to assist with offenders getting reintegrated back into um, society. Um, and there's guidelines which I will have um, put out for you if you want to download. Um, so we've got the um, strict license conditions, um, mm. sexual harm prevention order, sexual offender registers, etc., etc., um, to assist them getting back into society. Just to um, kind of answer the question from a different perspective mm -hmm. as well, though, because <coughs> obviously it is an international problem, and many of the you know, hashtag everyday sex, many of these things sort of started in the US and have, and have moved to the UK. Um, whilst we have this kind of revulsion of people that we all accept as sex offenders in society, mm -hmm. there's actually quite widespread acceptance of low-level sexual harassment. Mm -hmm. So I saw a debate between two people, a woman who was saying that men shouldn't ever wolf whistle like women in the street, it shouldn't ever catcall no matter what, and a man who was saying that men have the right to do this, a lot of women find it flattering, you know, how else are you supposed to acknowledge a woman's attractiveness? why you need to do that uh, but um <laughs> you, how else are you supposed to do that and it's, yeah. it's a very fundamental male right apparently um that, and I he suppose that sorry just to so quickly say i think that's the concept of masculinity isn't it that men are being taught a certain thing and mm. which is kind of just conflicting views really yeah which it? again mm. they're then victims of because then if they're a victim of sexual harassment they're told to man up and be flattered which is ridiculous but th this this man was saying that women should just say, go away if you don't like it. And the woman was explaining that actually... Women do? Wom yes. I've, I've heard of cases where women do. And Some women still. do, but also you can be physically attacked. And she, she cited a case that had happened a couple of weeks before mm -hmm. where a woman had been killed for that. She'd been shot oh because the man was so... His mass, he, he, fronted by this <coughs> sorry, challenge to his masculinity that he actually killed her. And so the man turned around and said, well, then why don't women carry guns? Carry guns and wave there them around if you don't want to be sexually there we go harassed. Victim blaming again. It's 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 awful. Um, and regarding, um, sorry, I'm, I'm really flabbergasted by that. That's horrible. I know it's That's unbelievable. She couldn't even answer. She was just. It's a clip on YouTube. It's an American chat show. If you send me the uh, so if we thing, find the link, we can we can put in. Yeah, yeah. I mean, give it give it a share. Um, and the med the I think the final question we've got here. Um, 
the, the specific question is, do the media impact con the controversy surrounding sexual offences? Um, before we uh, I'll get you to answer, I'm just going to make a uh, reference to what Sarah um, inputted into this. Um, she believes that it does have a huge input and it provides a bit of moral panic. Um, and she made reference to the Jimmy Savile case. Mm. Um, she basically said, it appeared to have led a national feeling of um, never feeling safe, obviously, you know, um, putting your children in certain situations with trust people you believe that are trusted. Mm. Um, and she made reference mainly to, um, obviously, child sex offending. Um, but moving on from that, I personally think um, the media do have a massive impact. Mm. Um, but regarding, you know, sexual offending against women, um, and I'm going to make reference to uh, the Harvey Weinstein case, that's completely, it's, it's just blown my mind. It's completely mm. blown my mind how, you know, there's a bit of solidarity between women and, pe and victims of sexual offending. So I think the media do play a good, uh, as bad as, you know, the, the media can be in some cases, I do think they play a positive impact on um, on this, mm. because women have come forward, you know, women are more open to expressing how they feel about what's happened, because a lot of these cases happened years ago, mm. do you know what I mean? So, um, you know, it's, it's given that, that paramount foundation for women to come forward and um, express their views, and men even, because mm. even men were coming forward, like you said, Tom Jones. Um, mm. Oh, there was Quentin Tarantino, yeah, that was the, the other one. Day. That was Not the as, one. A, as someone who's a victim, but yeah, someone who knew mm -hmm. new victims. Yeah, exactly. And um, unfortunately, these sexual offending happen. Sexual offences take place in a lot of secretive uh, mm. places, so it's quite difficult for people to come forward, especially when they're in environments where they feel that they can't come forward at all. So, thankfully, the media have played a very positive role. Maybe a negative role in, you know, um, s some some articles in the way that they. Mm. They, dis they, they explain victims or they say, you know, this woman, she wore a mini skirt, but she ended up getting sexually assaulted. A bit of victim blaming mm. at the same time, but I think the overall um, concept is there's a bit of solidarity, thankfully. Yeah, I, I think with, with uh, I think, like you said, the media is, is basically, obviously, is, it, it is a tool and it can be used positively or negatively. And in this case, I think that there's mix, really, because... A lot of the men who've made statements, the only reason I found Quentin Tarantino's statement particularly interesting, not just because I'm a massive fan of his, but also be of his work, but because um, also because it was more honest. He mm -hmm. was actually admitting that he'd done something wrong. And one of the problems is that people are so afraid of the media that when men come forward afterwards who, who have known about it, they give very bland statements saying, this is shocking, this is terrible. Had I known this, I wouldn't have been friends with him. And you think, in, in some of these cases, you knew damn well. You must yeah. have done. So sometimes the media can frighten people so much they don't give honest statements. Um, Tarantino's statement was was seemed pretty honest, saying that I knew I could have done something and I didn't, and I'm sorry, um, which is good, I suppose, although he's admitting that basically he allowed people, he kind of is, one like of his ex-girlfriends exactly to be victimised. Yeah, exactly facilitated it, but um, he could have deterred it really, couldn't he? Yeah, I'm, I mean, the, the media's always give very mixed reactions, because, you know, it often it would depend on the tide of public opinion, it would depend on um, who the person accused is. So I remember reading an article probably about five years ago in uh, one of the, I think it was one of the tabloids, mm -hmm. where they were talking about what constitutes rape and what they, they gave two examples. And the one was of two Christian missionaries who'd been raped on a beach um, in, I think it was in Africa. And the other was of a girl who got, and they used the word sozzled, so you can tell the audience that's meant for, it's meant obviously for a much older audience. A girl basically got drunk and couldn't remember if she had sex and accused a man of rape. And they presented that as though those are the two options, as though either it's somebody that is doing it because they can't remember. Well, actually, if you can't remember and you think someone had sex with you, it's worth reporting because a crime may have been committed and if you're so drunk that you blacked out mm -hmm. and they had sex with you, you then that is a crime. The to, to, but to also consent. to present it as though those are the only two options. You're either a Christian missionary or you're someone who got very, very drunk. There are so many sort of areas in, in between. In between, yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, th I think the media, in terms of um, 
people who've committed sexual offence against children, I think the media are very good at frightening people mm. very much. I mean, the recidivism rate is nowhere near as high as people actually think mm -hmm. for, for sexual offences. People assume it's like 100%. It's really not. It's much, much lower than some other offences. Um, but the media uh, portray it as though it's, it's this sort of incurable thing that makes you completely evil. There's only one way to do it, as in, you know, there are only one type of... Um, sex offender who mm -hmm. offends against children when actually yeah. there are people who are Multiple. sadistic yeah. there are people who um, are incapable of having adult relationships and with therapy they no longer feel even the need to offend there are people who are clinically paedophiles mm -hmm. there are loads There's of so different many different people. forms but the media just want to focus seem to end up um, enjoying focusing on the one absolutely um well i think that brings us to the end of today's episode um, and we're going to close it here. Um, and if you've got any views on the concept of sexual offending, we have had a look at um, criminological theory as well. And we'll refer to those on the social media pages. Um, and we'll drop a link down in the description for any references or anything that we've got. Um, and if you want to join the conversation or if you don't agree with something me or Laura said, we won't take any uh, we won't take anything personally um, but yeah just drop us an email send us a tweet find us on Facebook at the crummy talk and um, that's us for today uh, we're done thank you very much Laura thanks <laughs> until the next episode <laughs> bye bye <laughs>